Then let me introduce our, our speaker today, Aparaita Singer. So very nice, Apa, that you ac accepted our invitation and it's great to, to have you here. So for those of you who are not familiar with her, let me very briefly introduce her. So she got a PhD in, in 2017 at the EPFL in the group of Harald Brune. And the title was Magnetic Properties of Surface Adsorbed Single Rare Earth Atoms, Molecules and Atomic Clusters. And after that, she, she went and did a postdoc at the Center for Quantum Nanoscience QNS in Seoul, South Korea, for a couple of years. And then since 2020, uh, APA is an independent group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Solid State Research in Stuttgart. And she's also an Elizabeth Schiemann colleague and an, an early career researcher at the Center, of, Center for Integrated Quantum Science and Technology. And since the August this year, uh, she also has this Emmy Noether Research Group leader status. Um, her group is focusing on exploring magnetism at the single spin level using solid state defect centers. And, and these efforts are devoted to understanding and controlling quantum mechanical properties uh, of these smallest building blocks of matter, especially by probing, the, probing them in the least invasive manner. And, and these are of course challenging and delicate, and, and they use state-of-the-art, highly sensitive NV magnetometric techniques for this. And that's, I think we are going to hear more about that today. The title of her talk today is Non-Invasive Sensing and Quantum Control Using NV Centers. And with that, we very much look forward to your talk. So please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter and Jose, for inviting me here. And thank you for continuing with this great uh, series of colloquium. And with this, I should also say hi to everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk. Um, it's my pleasure to be presenting here today um, about our research on non-invasive sensing and quantum control at the single spin level using NV centers or NV magnetometry. Um, so atoms and molecules sitting on a surface are um, interesting for their um, appeal in fundamental uh, science and research, but also for their immediate technological relevance, for example, in quantum computing research or um, quantum information technology. Um, so basically for me, that leads to a rather simple question, a question probably simple to ask, but very hard to answer. And that is uh, essentially, can we detect and control um, quantum fingerprints at the atomic scale or single molecular scale uh, across a wide range of temperature? Now, I'm somebody who really likes to, who really enjoys understanding things at the fundamental level. And this pretty much started uh, back home uh, where I got my physics education um, during bachelor's and master's in India. So for those who know India, um, uh, Calcutta and Mumbai are not the same place. So Mumbai would be somewhere here, Calcutta would be somebody, somewhere here. So it's quite far from each other. So this is where I got my basic physics education and uh, actually, incidentally, I should also mention that when I was uh, choosing physics as my uh, career, the main concern of my family was that I will never get married. Um, I also got married in Mumbai when I was studying my master's, right, finishing my master's. Anyhow, but that's not what, what kept me going. What actually kept me going is the uh, basic question regarding uh, how to explore simple system. And actually, I was looking for simple system um, something like a textbook uh, material where you can, you know, calculate the Hamiltonian and you can have only a few uh, numbers of energy levels that you can probe and manipulate um, experimentally. And this is pretty much what kept me going and moved me around this part of the globe during the last um, 11 years or so. So that started with um, my uh, studies of, of biophysics, in fact, in Copenhagen, where I was looking at molecular dynamics. And the challenge here was to look at a single protein molecule in action. This molecule is present in our body as humans, but also in plants. So it's pretty ubiquitous. And uh, yeah, essentially the challenge was to look at this molecule in an optical way in action. The dynamics here is in the time scale of minutes. So this was rather slow and was relatively easy to, to perform, but I very soon realized that this is far from being a simple system. But this also told me that there is a lot to explore in terms of um, 
uh, fundamental interactions that happen at the atomic and molecular scale. So then I moved to Lausanne to actually pursue my PhD, where the question was um, how to understand magnetism at the single atom and single molecule level. So essentially magnetism, we know that this is um, a, a quantum phenomena, but, but this is also um, in, in a, in a um, in a solid state, in, in a bulk physics, this is a bulk phenomena, right? So um, the spins within atoms have to orient themselves in a, in a particular way in order to manifest uh, ferromagnetism, diamagnetism, and so on. But the question we were asking here is, how would this definition change if we were to look at a single atom or a single molecule at a time, right? And uh, is there a way to make a stable magnet out of a single atom? So I will briefly discuss about that in detail, but long story short, we first had to characterize uh, several atom surface interaction to understand what kind of surface um, atom interaction would completely fail, and then to realize what type of interaction uh, promotes stable magnetism at the single atomic, single molecular level uh, on surface. Once we had this, I was further interested in, in knowing whether it's possible to have quantum control and exquisite quantum control on this um, type of newly discovered atomic scale or molecular scale magnets on surface. This is when I was moving for my postdoc um, to, to Korea in the group of Professor Andreas Heinrich uh, in the newly built Center for Quantum, uh, for quantum Nanoscience. And uh, here also, long story short, there was uh, not a possibility that we go on top of the atomic scale magnet that I was talking about directly with your um, local probe, but you had to sit at a distant atom to understand what's going on uh, on the atom of your interest or, or the atomic scale magnet of your interest. So I will also briefly talk about that in my talk. So moving on, when I realized that this is probably not the best uh, system to try and look at this atomic scale magnet, I was looking for uh, possible uh, measurement tools that will allow me to do so. And this is when I moved to Stuttgart, uh, where we are trying to develop a technique that will allow us to look at this atomic and molecular scale magnet in a non-invasive manner, but also in a very sensitive manner using ND center as a local probe. So this is going to be the main part of my talk, uh, but to set the stage, let me start uh, with uh, the atomic skill magnets that I'm talking about. So to characterize them, we, or to understand them, uh, we had to combine different types of techniques. So one is X-ray magnetic circular dichroism, the other one is panning tunneling microscope. X-ray uh, magnetic circular dichroism, or XMCD, in short, is a technique that is an element-specific technique because you're using high-energy X-ray to probe really core level transitions. Uh, but also, this is a specially averaging technique because you have a broad sort of broad beam looking at a, a large area of your sample where you may have dilute, uh, diluted condition of your atoms and molecules. So atoms are sitting far apart from each other. So in a sense, you are measuring individual atoms, but an ensemble of them. So this is a specially averaging technique. And uh, also you need synchrotron to do this kind of measurements. Secondly, most of you already know this technique uh, in this audience, so I don't need to introduce this. This is scan scanning tunneling microscope. This does not have any element sensitivity, but it has very nice special resolution, really at the atomic scale, because here you use a sharp metal tip that you can magnetize or not, and you can go on top of the atom or molecule of interest uh, in a scanning probe fashion, and then you can uh, localize yourself on top of the atom of interest, and you can um, have your local measurements done. So we combine this to complementary sets of techniques to understand different spins on the surface and their properties. And this is pretty much the first system that we had encountered. Um, and the goal here was to stabilize magnetism with long magnetic lifetime, but also, uh, if possible, to extend the range of temperature um, or operational range of temperature uh, where this magnet still operates as stable magnet, right? So we had basically two different goals. And the first system that we encountered was this, uh, where um, we have RBM single atom or RBM trimers sitting on copper substrate. And we realized that this is the smallest um, scale of a magnet that you can have if you are 
using metal substrate as your supporting surface, simply because metal substrate has a lot of conduction electrons and phonons that can instantly uh, scatter from the uh, spin that you are trying to um, stabilize essentially on the surface. But in this case, uh, combining them as trimer gives you a T1 time of about two minutes at temperature of 2.5 Kelvin. And I remember at the time, the only other system that was available with this type of uh, behavior um, or, or long uh, magnetic uh, lifetime or T1 time at, at around this temperature was iron trimer on platinum one on one substrate. So pretty much this is one of the first one showing um, uh, the smallest um, uh, scale, uh, which is being a trimer directly sitting on metal substrate. But we also understood then that the metal substrate is not very good if you want to prolong this even further. So T1 going to some um, tens to, to, to hundreds, thousands of seconds, um, also to higher temperature, you would need to devise um, a different kind of substrate for yourself. And this is when we encountered um, the magnesium oxide surface, which is basically a thin insulating layer sitting directly on top of the metal substrate. You can deposit the atoms on top. So this is a real esteem image. Um, instead of this being a cartoon image, this is a real esteem image where you have single holmium atoms now sitting on the NGO surface. These are just uh, single defects. And um, uh, this is the magnetization loop uh, measured. Um, so this is basically magnetization axis. And this is um, on, the, on the X axis is the magnetic field. This is a synchrotron measurement where we first found uh, the holmium atoms being a stable magnet uh, operating with um, some tens of minute of time scale at low temperature, but also about a minute of time scale all the way up to 40 to 50 Kelvin or so. Um, so this is the first discovered single atom magnet sitting on MGO surface. Gives you a very nice visibility also with STM because this is a thin insulating layer. So the STM, uh, with the STM technique, you can still tunnel through uh, this thin insulating barrier. Further, we also realized that holmium is not the only system that behaves so nicely on this substrate, but also dysprosium is one of the other uh, elements that um, shows single atom magnet behavior on this particular substrate. In particular for dysprosium, we also see a change in valency of the dysprosium atom. So it goes from 4F9 to 4F10. If you go from very thin magnesium oxide to very thick magnesium oxide layer, uh, in both cases, uh, they are quite interesting. If you look at their magnetization loop, which are basically showing open loop hysteresis, uh, which says that it has a certain magnetic lifetime in the 4F9 case, uh, all the way up to high magnetic field, whereas in the 4F10 case, only up to about three Tesla or so. We further also tried understanding their properties uh, regarding the occupation in different magnetic um, uh, levels, uh, or different orbitals essentially by um, using higher energy of X-ray photons. And in this case, we could measure transitions, for example, from 3 to 4F or 3P to um, uh, 5D and so on. And this gives you for the first time a look at um, um, M23 type of transition, which wasn't measured um, before. So these are also single uh, rare earth atoms sitting on magnesium oxide surface. And then we also realized that magnesium oxide is not the only surface or magic substrate that gives you this nice T1 time or long T1 time at low temperature, but also at high temperature. But also there is another substrate, which is basically graphene and iridium. This particular substrate provides you with a template because graphene and iridium provides you with a Moira structure. And because of that, the atom that you put on top uh, also sees this, uh, this pattern um, created by the substrate um, and, and they arrange themselves in the form of a super lattice like you see uh, pretty much in this um, STM image. So these are all single dysprosium atoms sitting on this Moira structure provided by graphene and iridium substrate. And in this case, T1 time is also about, like in the case of holmium atoms on NGO, which is about 15 minutes at low temperature of 2.5 Kelvin. Now, if you really think about uh, all of these single atoms being um, a single atom magnet, um, the aerial density will turn out to be something like 100 terabit per inch square, which is really quite high if you really have to think about in storing information in each of these single atoms. So this is pretty much what the main goal behind this research was at that time. 
And this, of course, doesn't um, it is not complete if I don't mention um, uh, molecular scale magnet. We also did some research on this, um, especially with uh, terbium double decker molecule or double decker type of molecule with different rare earth atom sandwiched in between the double decker um, and, and molecular uh, ligands. Uh, but there are also other works. Very recently, there were works on dysprosium um, molecule, where the dysprosium is sitting between these type of molecular ligands or different other type of molecular ligands, where the uh, T1 time is long, but also the temperature up to which these systems behave as single molecule magnet um, is extended all the way up to liquid nitrogen temperature, so up to 80 Kelvin or so. Uh, so, of course, these molecules are very difficult to put on the surface because of their, because otherwise, uh, when you want to do thermal evaporation, they probably will not retain their structural integrity. Uh, but nevertheless, this is quite an um, 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 advancement in the field where uh, stability has been possible to extend uh, all the way up to liquid nitrogen temperature. Now, the question comes whether it is possible to look at their quantum coherent properties and, and have you know, exquisite control on that, uh, especially the ones containing lanthanide species, because those are the ones showing long T1 time, but also showing the potential to uh, extend us um, uh, to, uh, you know, beyond 4 Kelvin regime of, of temperature. So this is when I was uh, interested in, in looking at this particular technique, which was at the time very new electron spin resonance combined with scanning tunnel in microscopy, so essentially, this was when I was in, in Korea in QNS. Um, so here you have the technique where you have the STM tip, which is magnetized. So you can pick up magnetic atom from the surface to magnetize your tip. And then you can either sweep your external radio frequency to find your transition. Um, but also, you can uh, do it by keeping the frequency constant, but sweeping only the external magnetic field in this case that is provided by the tip. So basically by sweeping your, um, um, so by approaching your magnetic tip towards the surface, um, you can also induce uh, this electron spin resonance transition really at the atomic scale. And this is what I was showing here in cartoon, but now let me show you the real data. So this is um, one of the very first uh, results from, uh, from QNS uh, with the Inisoku machine where we were uh, fixing our frequency from 11 gigahertz to 21 gigahertz. And uh, we were also um, sweeping our tip magnetic field from 50 to 200 millitesla. And um, we saw the ESA transition like this on a single iron atom. Uh, so as you see in this case, um, in, in this regime, the tip is farther away. And here the tip is uh, closer to the iron atom on the surface. And at a particular position where the iron atom sees the exact magnetic field that it needs to resonate at, for example, 11 gigahertz, it will show you this change in the um, tunnel current. And this is what basically is your um, ESR signal. So of course, because of um, doing it with the T-field sweep, uh, the, the, the peak here is rather broad um, in some uh, tens of uh, millitesla or so. So you also don't have sensitivity if something is happening within tens of millitesla. You can gain a little bit, but this can only go to few millitesla um, or so. But now, as I um, promised you before, my um, motivation was actually to understand what is happening on the dysprosium atom here um, or, or the rare earth atom sitting next to the iron. And um, that's when we try to basically make different types of clusters um, containing iron and dysprosium atoms. So this is, for example, an iron atom um, isolated. And this is where you see the electron spin resonance signal, the ESR signal like this at, at zero external magnetic field, but only the deep field is providing us the, the field needed to uh, see this resonance. And then we uh, bring one dysprosium atom next to the iron. So this is now sitting at uh, 1.29 nanometer of separation between each other. You start to see a shoulder here, and that shoulder becomes even more prominent when you have the dysprosium atom sitting even closer to the iron atom here. Now, I should mention that this is not the iron atom flipping back and forth, but this is rather um, the, the, the appearance of the two peaks actually tells us 
um, the dipolar magnetic field created by the dysprosium atom onto the iron um, atom where we are doing our measurements. So as I said briefly before, you could not go on top of the dysprosium atom directly to probe uh, ESR transition on the dysprosium atom, but rather you had to see that the iron to understand what's going on on the dysprosium atom of interest. And then uh, we also characterized it even further by um, sweeping our external magnetic field from zero to plus minus 15 millitesla. And at the same time, we also swept our um, uh, external tip field. Here you see in the two dots, for example, the two the, the position of the two peaks, uh, for example, this and this. Um, and you would just uh, try to understand how these two peaks are basically crossing each other, because the crossing point is something that gives you, uh, one, the orientation of the uh, dysprosium atom in the cluster, but also uh, the dipolar magnetic field that the iron atom is seeing from the dysprosium atom sitting next to it. Um, and by doing this uh, analysis, we also uh, see not only by tip field sweep, but also frequency sweep um, uh, that we can measure the, the uh, dipolar magnetic field of the dysprosium atom and the, and the uh, magnetic moment of the dysprosium atom. And in both cases, the frequency sweep and, and the uh, tip field sweep uh, at uh, two different fixed frequency matches with each other very well. Um, but as you can see that these measurements had to be done at less than four Kelvin temperature, because this is where our STM, uh, ESR STM operated the best. And uh, the higher you go with temperature, probably broader these this transitions are going to be, and it will be more difficult to, um, uh, you know, um, uh, see the separation between the two peaks, for example, in this case, where the uh, dimer is at 1.29 nanometer from each other, you already almost don't see the other peak if you are not uh, too careful, um, uh, and also if the temperature was not low enough. So all these measurements essentially that I'm showing here are done within one Kelvin of temperature. Um, we see that uh, the ESR uh, feature of the dysprosium atom in a, in a dimer or even uh, I will show you later in, in, a, in a cluster, in a dye structure would remain the same unless and until you go on top of the dysprosium atom of interest and actually shower it with a lot of uh, high energy electron, almost about 250 millivolt or so, only then the dysprosium atom will switch from let's say spin up state to spin down state. And then the characteristic feature here will also change. So this often happened only if we um, intentionally changed and switched the direction of the dysprosium atom, and it didn't happen on its own, even in the time scale of hours to days. So this pretty much told us that the time scale T1 here for the dysprosium atom um, is at least about hours, if not already day time scales. So they are pretty stable, and if you want, very stubborn magnet on the MGO surface, but there was no way uh, to look at their T2 properties or to drive their uh, spin resonance um, uh, directly on the dysprosium atom itself. And now I was uh, mentioning before, we also created different kinds of fancy structure. For example, this is a dye structure uh, where on the way of building the structure, we also looked at uh, the ESR transition on the single iron atom and then on the dimer and, and so on. Um, and as I was mentioning before, you can, um, of course, um, take a look at how um, uh, well um, the iron atom is seeing the, um, the magnetic field from the different dysprosium atoms sitting um, next to it. So basically, you can engineer the magnetic field uh, really at the atomic scale using the dysprosium atom as stable magnet sitting next to the iron. But it, these features will also not change um, unless and until you switch the dysprosium atom of interest, which is what we are doing here. For example, in this case, they were all pointing, let's say, down or like into, um, into the screen. Um, and then one by one, we switched the directionality of the dysprosium atom by showering with high energy uh, electron, tunneling electron, um, almost 250 millivolt or so. And then you would see that you would see a, a symmetric um, a peak around uh, the case where you perfectly cancel the dipolar magnetic field felt by the iron atom here. But again, there was no way to have access to the T2 time of this particular system. Now, you might even ask if this is a, a good system to try and measure uh, T2 on or, or try to do ESR uh, measurements on. And it turns out it is. So uh, just last week, this paper got accepted in PRB 
where we are um, uh, looking at two particular systems and we identified them as potential candidates, uh, candidate lanthanide system that one can uh, measure using ESRSTM. So one is RVM atom sitting on MGO, the other one is uh, Tulium atom sitting on MGO. In both cases, you would have, uh, for example, these two states, which would be um, ESR um, uh, possible to drive with ESR. Um, in this case, this is within um, half a millivolt of, of separation, whereas uh, same in this case as well, but in case of Tulium, you see here um, a, a big difference between distance between the uh, lowest uh, doublet to the next um, higher one, which is about 65 millivolts. So in this case, probably they are even more protected from um, uh, you know, um, any possible qubit leakage to the excited state. So this is probably um, an even better uh, system to look at. And we also uh, do some calculation based on um, um, uh, the models that are available um, out there uh, describing the ESRST mechanism. And it turns out that the Rabi rate would go up to almost about 500 megahertz or so. So they, they are pretty high and uh, the characteristics can be rather good uh, compared to all the systems that have been studied up to date. So yeah, these are potentially interesting systems. Now you might also ask if um, the tool that I'm choosing now, uh, which is essentially NV Center, if this is a good tool to, to use as well in terms of um, looking at this uh, um, isolated lanthanide spin systems on surface, on the NGO surface, for instance. So that brings me to the point where I should introduce the NV Center as a technique. So NV is basically nitrogen and a vacancy. So that's why this is called NV sitting within the bulk of diamonds. So essentially you kick out one carbon atom from the uh, bulk crystal structure of diamond and you introduce next to the vacancy and nitrogen atom and they together more or less behave like a molecule with very discrete sets of energy levels and very well-defined um, uh, feature. And um, that is essentially uh, sitting within the bulk band cap of diamond, which is about 5.5 EV. So this is conduction and valence band of diamond in the schematic. And here you have your NV center. So essentially everything that I'm going to talk about today happens to be um, the case for a nitrogen atom, a vacancy and an electron um, sitting next to it. So this is an NV minus center. Um, that's the one that, that is um, heavily used or only used for, um, and that's the only one that is used for quantum sensing, uh, especially with magnetometry. Um, so that's the one that will have this kind of um, energy level diagram. Now let's take a bit of a closer look at it. So essentially the beauty of NV Center is that if you shine a um, green laser, it emits red photon because it has this uh, triplet um, ground state, also triplet excited state. So this is MS equals zero. This is plus minus one. Uh, there is a zero field splitting of about 2.87 uh, gigahertz. You can also apply external magnetic field to split the plus minus one level a bit farther. Now the amount of red photons that comes out of the NV center strongly depends on um, uh, the spin state that the NV center is at. So essentially, if, for example, if it is at MS equals zero state, you will have higher fluorescence count, a higher amount of red photons coming out compared to the case when it starts its travel from the plus minus one state. And this difference is about as high as 30%. So that gives you a very good contrast when you want to distinguish between zero and plus minus one state. And that's what is called optically detected magnetic resonance or ODMR. So basically um, what you do in this case is um, initialize your NV center in the MS equals zero state. Um, and then also in the end, you all read it out with the same green laser. Um, that's another beauty that you can use the same um, laser for initialization and readout protocol. And in between, you can uh, switch the population between zero and plus minus one state by applying a pipe pulse. And that essentially is going to make a transition from zero to plus or minus one. When you do not have any external magnetic field applied, um, you have then only one deep available because the system makes a transition from zero to the average of plus minus one state. Um, but when you have an external magnetic field applied, you also split the two peaks because of Zeeman splitting. And by looking at the separation between the two peaks, you can very easily understand what is the amount of magnetic field that you have applied. So essentially, this is the easiest scheme that you can have 
um, uh, to implement your NV center as a magnetometer um, and to look at a DC magnetic field um, uh, of interest. So this is our measurement data for, for ODMR. But now let me also answer the question why this could be potentially a very interesting tool to look at such a single spin on the surface. So here I have uh, found this excellent com comparison of, of NV center with respect to other, let's say, um, uh, forefront contenders of, of um, uh, sensing uh, tools, for example, squid on tip or MFM and so on. Um, scanning NV magnetometer compared to the others comes with these three um, very nice properties that I have highlighted here with, uh, with a, a circle. So first of all, it has a sensor size, which is essentially atomic scale. So it's, it's within the nanometer scale, uh, which actually um, brings us to the point that the spatial resolution does not have to be limited as such to very high value. Practically right now, this is limited to only, uh, even though it is written here 15 to 25 nanometer, it actually is um, much higher. On a regular basis, you would get probably 50 to 100 nanometer instead of, of this, this um, length scale. But in fact, the physics does, does not stop us from gaining a bit uh, better than this. So really at the atomic scale should be possible to achieve um, with this um, uh, type of defect center as well. Of course, it's hard and I will come to that um, in a short moment. Besides this, this also has an operating temperature, um, which um, is operating all the way up to room temperature and even beyond. So in this case, this is even going all the way up to 600 Kelvin. So this gives you um, an interesting feature that you can look at systems that are potentially interesting for high temperature applications as well. The ones, for example, I, I briefly mentioned um, uh, that, that allows us to go beyond uh, 4 Kelvin temperature or, or takes us to um, a liquid nitrogen temperature and so on. So they are also, in particular, NV Center would be a very good probe uh, to look at these systems. And then comes the sensitivity when it uh, particularly is related to uh, magnetic sensing. Um, here I found this excellent uh, summary of how the NV Center can be used to look at magnetic field noise all the way from DC or CW ODMR, this is called, uh, to T1 relaxometry is what you will use if you are uh, looking at a gigahertz uh, um, oscillation of your uh, magnetic field. So essentially, you can use this magnetometer by using different types of pulse schemes and measurement protocols. You can use it to measure all the way from DC to gigahertz magnetic field noise. So this also kind of opens up your possibilities to a great deal. This is why um, I chose NV Center for our uh, tool, but now I come to the point of why this is so um, crucial and, and so difficult to achieve and has not been achieved so far probably, is um, mostly to do with the spatial resolution, right? So NV Center is a defect that has to sit within the bulk of diamond because if you remember, I briefly talked about the electron that is that has to be there for us to use it as a, as a, um, as a magnetic sensor. The moment you bring it close to the surface and make it shallow and bring it close to the, you know, to the to the end of the tip, for instance, um, it easily loses this electron to the surface imperfections or the charge trap. So it undergoes charge transfer essentially and loses this electron, which essentially then um, affects the spin and optical property of the NV center. If you lose the optical property of the NV center, you can't use it as a magnetic field sensor. So essentially that's what limits us to use it as a very um, good magnetic field sensor with highest possible special resolution. Um, so as you can see in the schematic, the NV center right now has to, has to sit very much deep inside the bulk of diamond of about more than 20 nanometer or so. Um, and of obviously that increases the imaging footprint as well. Now, as you can see in this uh, list of um, References, it's not a new problem. It has been detected uh, since quite some time by several groups. There are several ways to address this problem in shallow NV and to make shallow NV centers alive. Um, very recent ones are actually um, trying to have electrical control. So basically pulse it with very high energy um, uh, uh, pulse. And, and that allows you to locally keep the electron and basically you inject with, with electron locally to the NV center. And that would be a way to uh, revive shallow NV centers within five nanometer from the surface or so. 
Our goal here is to use uh, what other people are not really using um, is uh, controlled surface chemistry. And I um, rather would like to emphasize on the fact that it's a controlled surface chemistry because we have access to ultra high vacuum preparation chamber, which allows us to have this exquisite control on what we have on the diamond surface. So we can treat the diamond surface in different ways. We can coat it with different types of layers. And as you can see, probably in this um, uh, uh, little um, white marks here um, of different shape. So before putting this kind of coating layer, the diamond surface, of course, was uh, uh, containing a lot of craters and, and imperfections, which all of them can actually act as charge traps, which takes away the electron from the shallow MP centers. Our goal is to uh, prepare the diamond surface and passivate it in such a way that uh, these charge traps are now satisfied with the layer put on top, and it does not have to essentially steal the electron from the shallow MV center itself. So this is this would be one way to revive the shallow MV center within one to two nanometer of, of the surface. That's basically the aim that we have in this part. In the next part, then, of course, we want to exploit uh, you know, all the measurement protocols that are uh, well known and well established in the, in the mature field of MV sensing. But those are yet to be properly exploited in the field of single spin on surface. So here I see a lot of room where we can um, essentially combine this, um, these two fields and, and, and breach this gap of knowledge and, and kind of develop a new direction altogether. And finally, we also want to extend this uh, with a, a cheap geometry with shallow NV center on the tip um, where you can use, um, um, you know, atomic scale, micro, um, atomic force uh, microscopy technique um, with the NV center within the tip uh, to look at um, surface embedded atoms. I will briefly mention that as well towards the end of my talk, where you can stabilize the single spin on the surface, essentially by embedding them. And uh, because of surface embedding, you can stabilize them all the way up to room temperature. So this is a structural stability. Not much is known about their magnetic properties. Here I see a lot of room where we can use our um, advanced, uh, specially resolved MP magnetometry technique as well to look at these systems. All right, so with that, let me introduce you to the two setups that I have. This is one of the setups. Um, here I have the preparation chamber. Um, this is the cryostat. It's a 4K bath cryostat. The measurement head would be sitting somewhere over here. And um, essentially, I have this set up um, essentially inherited from one of my predecessors, um, uh, Professor Marcus Chanis. He actually was one of the ones who built this setup. And uh, now, using my Eminoiter uh, research uh, funding, I will be able to upgrade this preparation chamber further so that we can have full control on the um, uh, diamond surface uh, that we probe. In this setup, we essentially look at systems like this, where we have diamond surface uh, like this, and then we have diamond nanopillars. Each of these nanopillars are about one micron high, and the top radius here would be about one, a couple of hundred nanometers. Uh, this you can tune pretty much. The distance between each uh, nanopillar would be about one micron as well. Each nanopillar would contain a single NV center. We can also verify that if it contains one or more. I will also talk about that shortly. And then you can address them using um, your green laser as soon as you have um, an NV center uh, within the nanopillar that will, of course, glow and you will be able to collect the red photon from it. And the sole purpose of this particular setup is to look at this, um, uh, the property, optical and spin property of the shallow NV center uh, by coating the surface with different types of materials. And this is currently the task that Tony and Atharva um, are, are doing uh, and continuing on the setup. The next setup is something that we are building from scratch. It's pretty much of a copy of the other setup, but upgraded in many ways. Uh, I forgot to mention that the optics here is underneath the setup, also in the other setup that we I showed in the previous slide. So optics comes underneath. This is a photograph taken even before the optics was integrated, so you don't see the optics here. Um, but basically, you are sending in the laser from below the setup. And here, also, the measurement setup is going to be um, somewhere over here. The upgrade here is essentially on the magnetic field. So it has one Tesla out of magnetic field, also 250 millitesla in both directions. So it's a full vector magnet that we can use. 
Um, and then in this particular setup, we have uh, the scanning probe geometry possible. So essentially we'll have the NV center um, as part of your AFM tip, um, the cryogenic objective is sitting at the 4K base plate and, and you will be sending in the laser uh, addressing the NV center, which should be sitting at a constant height. So it will not be moving. So it will also be at a constant X and Y position uh, because you have to keep it in focus. And then you have to scan across um, uh, by scanning the surface across the tip. Um, and on the surface is by, where you have your magnetic texture of interest. Uh, so this is how uh, you will be able to gather uh, what you have on the surface simply by looking at uh, the amount of red photons that come out from different areas on the surface that you are scanning across. So this is a setup that we are uh, building with Dinesh and Anshu, as well as Ricardo as a postdoc um, on, on this setup. Both of these setups um, require an upgrade, uh, which I will be able to do with the Eminoeta fund now. Uh, and the upgrade um, that is left now uh, is, is simply because of um, uh, the preparation chamber. Right now, we are at UHD less than 2, 10 to minus 10 millibar, but we don't have any surface sophisticated surface preparation possibilities, uh, which is what we want to upgrade this with. Now, let me uh, um, um, ask the obvious question, where are we now with respect to uh, uh, the goals that I briefly talked about? So either we are fixing different things on the setup and upgrading the optics, upgrading the setup itself, like you were seeing in this picture, or in this one where we were actually, this is on the new setup where we are trying to exchange the objective um, to a, a longer working distance objective because the short working distance objective that was only available in the market for low temperature operation wasn't really good enough. Uh, so we just replaced it and we were putting back the shields with Tony and Dinesh. Um, you see very recently last week, we got the uh, first measurement of our NV containing tip. So this is a diamond tip within a nanopillar. This is the NV center um, as, as the only brightest spot within the whole island. Um, and this is um, basically an UHV uh, measurement where we also see a very nice autocorrelation feature uh, going less than 0 0.5 here. The deep um, should be less than 0 0.5 because a single NV center should be a single photon source. Yeah, so this is just from last week. So we are continuing with the benchmarking process of the new setup as well. So either we are on this or the whole group uh, goes in front of a castle um, essentially taking selfie and without me. Um, so, so that's just a, a joke. So I didn't have the time uh, to enjoy it with them on that day. So that's why they had to just go on their own, taking selfie on their own. Now, let me ask uh, even more of a serious question in terms of uh, the science where we are. So this is uh, the first thing I did um, when I joined um, uh, in Stuttgart as a group leader. Um, as you know, NV Center doesn't have the special resolution that you can easily achieve with um, the state of the art as STM or even AFM. And we were looking at here um, um, a superconducting um, um, surface, which is LSEO, uh, prepared on an LA LSAO substrate. And here the idea was to look at collective spin phenomena in a non invasive manner possible. So this was an all optical measurement. Um, of course, verified afterwards with um, microwave um, measurements as well. Uh, in this measurement, inside the superconductor, we are supposed to see less drop in PL count simply because inside the superconductor, it expels the magnetic field uh, strongly, which is why the, the spin um, um, redistribution is not as much affected because it sees uh, the NV center sees less uh, magnetic field. And this is why it's, you have relatively less drop of uh, normalized PL count, whereas outside you have more drop of normalized PL count simply because here you see the full magnetic field, um, uh, at least almost full magnetic field. And this is how the geometry was. Part of the sample was seeing uh, the LSAO. So part of the sample, meaning part of the sample containing NV center was seeing the LSAO, uh, LSEO, um, and, and the rest of it was not seeing uh, the superconductor. And this is why you see um, a very clear difference uh, back and forth um, if you measure on this part or on this part. We, of course, verified it by measuring the ODMR measurements as well. And um, here we see, for example, um, a relatively small amount of splitting, which talks about small amount of external magnetic fields that the NV center is 
feeling here compared to outside of the superconductor where you see uh, nearly double or more than double of the magnetic field that was applied. Now, beyond that, we also were interested in really understanding the shallow NV centers, right? Like I mentioned before. And this is uh, one of the newest results that we have right now. This is under review where we looked at a shallow NV center or actually we got the statistics of several shallow NV centers. And we realized that if you look at the shallow NV center under ultra high vacuum four Kelvin condition in a pristine condition where you do not have anything uh, modified on the diamond surface, you do not have any feature that certifies it as a single NV center, as a single potent source. So as you can see here, this is autocorrelation measurement. You completely quench the autocorrelation behavior. Now, as soon as you treat the diamond surface with very mild surface chemistry, I should probably be a bit careful calling it a surface chemistry because all we did here is to dose the surface in a controlled way with very thin layer of water. And that seems to recover the autocorrelation signal here very well. And this is not only seen in autocorrelation, but also in the emission spectroscopy. Now, imagine that this is actually um, an emission spectra from a single NV center uh, as a single photon source. As a uh, NV minus center, where you did not lose the NV, um, the, the, the electron uh, to the surface due to charge transfer, you are expected to see uh, a peak here at 637 nanometer. Uh, whereas when it has lost the electron, you are supposed to see um, a peak here at 575 nanometer. So before we did any treatment in the low temperature in which we condition, we had mostly this cyan case where you, we had NV0, whereas after dosing with water, we see a complete shift of the phonon sideband as well as one would expect if it turns into NV minus. So this control dosing of water actually helped in reviving shallow NV centers, which is also verified with the ODMR measurements. As you can see here, there was no ODMR to see, whereas after dosing water, we start to revive um, um, very small amount of ODMR signal. Of course, this is a partial recovery. It does not give you the full recovery of 20% of ODMR contrast, probably because the water uh, does not, it does the partial job. It does not do the full job of, of um, completely shifting it in time uh, to NV minus. And it, it probably in this case also, it is still switching between NV minus and NV zero with very, very slow dynamics. Um, so we would, in the end, have to find out a more uh, robust surface chemistry that would work in this direction. Um, but this at least proves that we are on the right track in attacking the problem uh, in a controlled surface chemistry approach. Also, we have done DFT calculation to um, kind of rationalize why the uh, water uh, layer is helping reviving shallow NV centers. And as you can see here, that in the uh, natural um, uh, room temperature ambient condition uh, situation, uh, this is where you have uh, uh, the, the crossover between the Fermi level and the um, uh, energy level of the NV minus, or in this case also vacancy clusters, um, which is at about, um, let's say five nanometer or less than five nanometer of region. So basically, um, if you are shallower than five nanometer, the NV center is more li likely to lose the electron and, and, and lose its coherence um, um, and, and optical properties. Um, when we put it in the low temperature UHV stage, this depth basically got extended to 12 nanometer or so. So now, all your NV centers that are sitting within 12 nanometer from the surface will not be useful anymore. After putting water on the surface, we have been able to recover it. Um, not as good as the ambient condition, but almost to the same level, because in this case, this was about a little bit more than six nanometer of depth. Um, so this is right now under uh, evaluation. And this, uh, this was done in collaboration with um, the group of Professor Adam Ghali, especially for the uh, DFT calculation. Even beyond that, we also have been able to look at the quantum control of buckyball skin spin qubits. In this case, we had the NV center sitting in, within the diamond nanopillar, and then we drop coated uh, this kind of molecule where we have a single nitrogen um, atom inside the um, C60 uh, cage. We also had the sample prepared such that it's diluted with empty molecules, many more empty molecules, so that we can ensure that statistically we are looking at a single 
uh, spin to single and vCenter um, um, coupling. So essentially, this molecule has the, this type of uh, energy level diagram where you are expected to see it's a spin three half system. So you have plus three half to minus three half four levels. And then you have also a nuclear spin um, a triplet situation. So plus minus one and zero level. And because of that, you have uh, the possibility to see three different types of transitions. Um, so during the measurement, first we try to measure um, um, or find a single NV center, and this we do by going on, to, on top of different nanopillars and checking if we see an autocorrelation signature um, going um, much below 0 0.5 in the G2 autocorrelation function. Once we see that, we stay on, the, on top of that particular NV center and try to see if we find any ESR transition coming from this particular molecule. And this we do by um, applying this type of uh, pulse sequence, which is essentially a standard um, Hanekoh sequence uh, for the NV center. So you have laser in for initialization, then you have pi by two pi and pi by two sequence uh, to run the Hanekoh um, sequence on the NV center. And then you, at the end, will do a readout using the green pulse again. And in between this Hanekoh sequence, you would also have to apply a pi pulse at a varying frequency only when your frequency matches the frequency of your external uh, spins that you have put on top, um, uh, you will see a net phase pickup. So NV center will have a net phase pickup. And because of that, you will see a drop in PL counts here as well. So all you are doing here is sweeping your frequency um, and uh, basically counting your red photons, the amount of red photons that comes out using your APDs. And as soon as you see this kind of drops, um, in this case, we were expecting to see three peaks, as I showed you in the previous diagram using the energy levels, um, you would see this type of um, a, a transition. And we actually see these three uh, distinct peaks, which are characteristic of those uh, coming from the energy levels of this particular molecule. And then you can sit on top of this uh, transition, either on the central one or one of the side ones. You can drive Ravi oscillation on that as well. Um, so this is when we were sitting at the central dip uh, with two different uh, powers um, uh, of the external um, uh, radio frequency. And as you can see, you can also see this Rabi oscillation simply by looking at the amount of red photons um, collected uh, by the uh, coming from the NV center and collected by the APDs as a function of your um, uh, timing here of the RF pulse. All right, so then uh, with that, in the end, we also have found out um, several systems that would be potentially interesting for high temperature application and measurements. This yeah, sorry, about, yeah. about five minutes left. Yeah, I'm almost finishing as well. So um, dysprosium atoms and MGO, um, uh, we know that they are uh, possibly stable all the way up to 25 Kelvin. We have not been able to characterize their uh, spin um, coherent property at this high temperature, um, but this would be interesting to see if we have this specially resolved NV magnetometric protocol. But there are also systems, if you, um, um, for example, surface embed the lanthanide atoms within NGO, they are structurally stable all the way up to 300 Kelvin or room temperature. Here are, um, so this is a, a work in preparation. Uh, so I show you only the esteem images here. So these are these surface embedded lanthanide single atoms. Um, here is a zoom in. This is, in this case, dysprosium atom in particular. And we also do um, some calculation of their energy level diagram. Turns out that interesting systems to look at would be dysprosium here or um, the gadolinium here as well, with some uh, interest also in, in samarium and tulium as well. Um, so with this, I would like to basically come to the end of my talk. This is the full overview of what we are going after in my research group now. So hopefully we'll be able to surpass the 4K limit and hopefully we'll be able to come up with novel type of spin qubit that can be probed using um, scanning and demagnetometry. So with this, this is the group that I'm working on, working with. Um, I'd like to thank them. So Ricardo is a postdoc who very recently joined my group. Anshu is a, um, is a, a PhD student applying for, for uh, the PhD graduate school now. Dinesh is finishing next year for PhD. And this is, of course, me. Uh, Tony is another postdoc who joined me nearly two years ago. And Atharva is also an aspiring PhD student in my group now. 
Um, my collaborators, Professor Klaus Kern and the team of Professor Jörg Rachtel, through which we go get this uh, nanofiller samples prepared almost on a daily basis. And um, of course, my funding agencies, um, DFG Eminoita Grant, um, IQST Young Researcher Grant. And right now I'm also an alumni in the Carl Zeiss uh, Foundation because of uh, being awarded the Nexus Grant um, earlier this year, which I had to give up because of accepting the Eminoita Grant. So with this, I would like to thank you and also, of course, Peter and Jose uh, for making this happen and, and for inviting me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Okay. While people are, are thinking about it, maybe I can I can start. I have a kind of a very long term question. So let's assume that I wanted to to do STM based atom manipulation and then probe the the resulting structure with NV magnetometry. So is there like uh, you have some ideas on how you would go in this direction? Essentially, I mean, it's a great question. Essentially, it should be possible because um, it should be possible. In, in You have to think about um, a system that, of course, has optical access, right? And, and that is operating as STM-AFM uh, type of um, um, configuration. Um, and why I say it should be possible is because um, the tip that I'm using or people are using with the NV center is very similar to um, uh, the um, Q plus sensor type of tips that you use, right? So there you have the tip and it's, um, it's <clears throat> in this configuration here, you have the surface and, and essentially um, you do this kind of motion or a vibration of the cantilevers, right? And in our case, it's like this. So there is no technical reason why it should not be possible to glue the tip at the end of this prong, let's say, and, and have it probed like that. Um, it's just that uh, the, the same tip cannot be used for doing STM because it's a diamond tip. So one has to come up with um, a bit of a different way to do STM um, in the same um, area, um, same junction. Uh, thanks. Yeah, Fabio? I mean, at the beginning, you showed this level scheme of the NV center and explained why this is so good for doing this magnetometry. So I was wondering, is there any dependence of this level scheme on the size of your bulk diamond piece? Or is there any minimum size that your diamond crystal should have for these properties to be fully explorable? But if you have like a really like a real nanoscale piece of diamond in one NV center, would this still work? Or is there some point where this level scheme will shift dramatically if you go too small with your diamond log piece? So uh, the, essentially, so for example, I know that uh, there are nano diamonds where uh, the size of the nano diamond is about five nanometer. That's the smallest that I know where you can still have a single NV center with its intact spin and optical properties. This is the lowest size that I, um, that I know of. Uh, of course, at some point, when you start making it smaller and smaller, the NV center is getting more and more closer to the surface. And then it, if it loses the electron, then it then it's gone. So then um, you don't have essentially that particular level diagram because you are now talking about only the NV, uh, so only the nitrogen and the vacancy without the electron, right? So then you yes. cannot think of it in, in, in the same way. Uh, so uh, state of the art, smallest, um, let's say nano diamond, um, that I know where you can have intact properties about five nanometer, but also on the tip, usually um, something like five to eight nanometer shallow NV center also survives. Whether it survives in UHV and low temperature, that is always a question. And typically shallow ones do not, um, do not like it in UHV, uh, where you have removed the uh, surface coverage layer that you usually have in ambient condition, which helps. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, also you can just go ahead. Hi, Barhida. Thanks a lot for the very nice talk. So I, I was wondering if you could use these NV centers to see dynamics of quantum magnets. So for example, if you think about some two-dimensional quantum spin liquid, could you see how the magnetization in space evolves in time after a pulse, or would this be something very challenging? No, I think in principle it should be possible to do, yes. Um, 
So you have to think about, um, so time resolution is something very tricky here because you also have to gather enough number of photons to distinguish between if you are seeing a bright state or a dark state. Um, but there are ways also to, to, to get there. And on the other hand, you also have to think about gigahertz. So it can go and detect up to gigahertz uh, of magnetic field noise. Uh, so in principle, it should be possible, yes, to look at dynamics. All right, thanks a lot. All right, any other questions from the audience? Okay, if not, then I think it's time to thank Abba again. Thanks a lot for a really nice talk. And, thank you. And we'll see everybody next year. So thanks and bye-bye from my side.